Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Hear Our Voices. This is your host, KJ, and now we have a, a nice guest. I can't wait for you to meet him. His name is David, and he's going to tell you what he does with the homeless community and how he helps to get the word out there. David? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I am a reporter for City Limits, a nonprofit news organization here in New York City, celebrating our 45th anniversary this year. And I cover housing and homelessness, particularly for City Limits. Uh, prior to my career in journalism, I was a, a, a social worker, a licensed social worker. I worked in supportive housing uh, and I worked Transition into journalism and into uh, into a role really focused on uh, on housing and homelessness. How do you get from social work to being a, a writer? That's kind of <laughs> that's two different things. Yeah, I mean it's it's a good question. So I, uh, you know, I was always really passionate about journalism, um, but honestly, I think I was scared to truly pursue uh, the job that I really wanted, which was in journalism. And so I had always worked in social services, uh, in social service jobs when I was like in high school and in college. And so that was kind of an easy transition into, uh, into social service work after college. Um, and it kind of fulfilled a lot of my journalistic curiosity of working with uh, various people and learning a lot about especially how lower income New Yorkers, New Yorkers experiencing homelessness uh, about the problems and, and obstacles that they encountered. And, you know, I really liked the job. I was working uh, as a case manager and in supportive housing at a couple of different organizations and uh, went to school to get my LMSW, um, to get my MSW and then to get licensed after that. Uh, but even, you know, toward the end of my grad school experience, I just couldn't deny anymore that you know, where, where I felt I could have the biggest impact and also pursue the thing that I was most passionate about would be uh, journalism. And so at that time, I was also, I was running programs that fused fitness and mental health for people living in supportive housing. So I was a, I was a, a personal trainer, also a social worker. So kind of using those skills um, and basically like a, fr a freelancer. So I was working with different organizations, going to sites in the Bronx and Washington Heights and Bed-Stuy, uh, really, I think like 10 different sites. And so I would have that work experience, but I would also have a lot of time to be able to do reporting and writing. And so gradually transitioning uh, from a, a freelance journalism role to a full-time one. And then I got a, a break at a newspaper in Queens that was just starting called the Queens Daily Eagle. They hired me to be the first editor. Um, and that was a, a cool experience. And so that was the, uh, that's how I made that shift. That's pretty cool, actually. That's really pretty cool. Thank you. So I wanna know from your writing, what do you think the most problems people have, like New Yorkers have with homelessness and from your point of view? Um, well, do you, do you mean like the problems that people experiencing homelessness have or the people, the problems that people have like with people who are homeless or with like, it could be both, honestly, yeah. from, your point of, from what you have seen and wrote about, about in your like your columns and stuff like that. Well, I think, I think the answer to a question of like, what is the biggest obstacle for people experiencing homelessness? And it's just uh, the total lack of affordable housing and how hard it is to find uh find an apartment that is priced, you know, in, in someone, especially for families and their price range. Um, and, you know, we've seen the city in recent months try to partially address that by raising the value of housing vouchers, uh, especially for families and in shelters. And I guess we'll see how that works out, but really there's so the amount of affordable housing. So limited, the competition for units is uh, so tight and also you know, a lot of landlords, unfortunately, just don't want to take uh, vouchers, the, like the city fest vouchers for people moving out of shelters. Um, you know, in terms of like another way to approach that question of like, what are the, the problems that people have with 
homelessness who aren't homeless. I think it's just kind of a, a, like misconceptions about who's experiencing homelessness and uh, what the, like, what that really means. And so I think people tend to think of uh, people experiencing homelessness as like single adults, uh, maybe with mental health uh, diagnoses or substance use issues. And so, you know, that, that kind of tends to lead to discrimination and you see that kind of played out in a lot of media. And also I noticed it a lot in the uh, Democratic primary for mayor, you had like Andrew Yang saying pretty discriminatory stuff against, uh, against people experiencing homelessness. And I, I think that a lot of people just tend to default to that narrative. And, you know, there are a significant number of, of adults who are experiencing homelessness and a lot of, you know, too many people who have to live in public spaces on the streets, but really the face of homelessness is families and especially families headed by single mothers. And I think they could tend to be kind of the, uh, the forgotten, uh, forgotten homeless. I think that's so true. I was in a meeting today. I was talking about that because me, myself, before I became homeless, I didn't think of families. I didn't think of mom and children, to be honest. I didn't even know the demographics of the numbers of people in shelter. When I thought of um, people who are homeless, I thought of the person on the street, the, the person who's not clean, the person who's begging for money, the person who's not like something's wrong with them and they can't live probably in a home because they just, they're just so out of it that they can't get any help. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the honest truth is when you look at the numbers and numbers are not going to lie to you, you know, what you see sometimes is not what actually what is happening. The numbers are showing you that moms and their kids are the highest demographic in shelter and domestic abuse is the highest domestic in shelter. And the way the media portrays it is never that. It's never, I think they took us away in, in buildings around New York City so people don't know the truth. And the truth is that a lot of families need help. And they, they don't seem like the people that, you know, could be a friend or your coworker. It just seems like, oh, there's a foreign entity who's homeless, who's out here, you know? But that's not the truth. So that's definitely true. I definitely believe that. And what do you think that your work that you do right now can change people's minds? Or what do you do, think it will help to get the word out there about with the homeless population? Well, I always try to connect with, with people who are experiencing it, uh, who can share their experiences and their perspective for the story to kind of, to kind of like what you said, you know, show that, you know, homelessness in New York city is not, is really like the, the people you see who are street homeless. That's really the tip of the iceberg that 70% of people in city shelters and DHS shelters are uh, families and almost always black or Latino families who are led by a single mother and that that's really the face of, of homelessness and uh, kind of shift the narrative and also try to, uh, I guess, yeah, try, try to help people consider like, how much more affordable housing we need in this city to to make sure that no families and no children are living in city shelters or experiencing chronic homelessness. What do you think we can do to get better affordable housing? Or what do you think we could put in place to make it easy for families, even regular single people who are homeless, to make it better for New York City? What ideas do you have? Do you have any? Yeah, I think that uh, just, I think building more affordable housing. Um, and then, you know, right now we have in New York City, in, in, when a community is, uh, is rezoned, that new development in the rezoned area has to have, uh, you know, mandatory inclusionary housing, they call it. And, and it's just like, apartments that are set aside for people making like a certain amount of money. Uh, and so lower income, middle income, New Yorkers. Now the communities that have been rezoned are mostly low income neighborhoods. And so this, the way that this, this housing system works now is that the income limits are set so that the people moving into these 
you know, supposedly affordable units are actually making more than the people in the, in the communities already. So I think a way to uh, expand affordable housing would be to mandate in any type of rezoning, like much more affordable apartments and also to rezone and upzone neighborhoods that are wealthier uh, instead of lower income neighborhoods so that you're making more affordable housing opportunities in wealthier neighborhoods. Um, I think that's one thing. I think what the city did to increase the uh, city FEPS voucher value so that families in shelter are able to use their voucher to actually afford apartments is going to be big. Um, you know, that just happened. Uh, I guess that took effect September 1st and here we are October 19th. So it's only been about a month and a half. So I guess we're going to see the impact of that, but you know, hopefully that's going to lead to more people actually able to use those vouchers and get housing. Um, and yeah, I think those are, I think those are two, two of the major things, just expanding the amount of actual affordable housing we have in the city and having people use those vouchers, you know, it could be interesting if the city built more, uh, public housing and more, uh, just, with NYCHA, they might have to get somebody else to run those public houses, <laughs> to be honest. If NYCHA is not what it cracks up to be, people think that, oh, because it's cheaper rent, because I live in NYCHA myself, it's cheaper rent, that yep. is gonna, everything's going to be okay. And granted, I feel so bad when I say, because I'm, I came from shelter, so I'm like, you basically came from nothing and complaining about what you have. But at the end of the day, certain things that you do want. Um, compared to other people I've heard, like example, if the water's off or there's no heat, majority of the time my water is, is on and I do kind of have heat in some of the rooms. So I just bought a heater because that's the only way you, you gotta yep. live. Yeah. Um, some people have a much worse, I've heard worse stories. We heard it on this podcast about NYCHA in general. So it's like, if we build more public housing, but the people who are taking care of these structures are not willing to take upkeep the structures or to make it better for people living in it, it's going to be building more and people are going to be more upset. <laughs> yeah. Because it just sounds so bad. It's like, you don't want to be ungrateful, but you do want certain things to be okay, you know? So that's my thing. Um, but I, I think we definitely need those things to make New York better. And I think we have the, maybe, I don't know where the space would be really, because I feel like, especially in Brooklyn, everything is so built up, but I guess they could find more space to put certain things. Um. My problem is when they put things like buildings in certain areas when it is high income areas and they need to make stuff around the like area where people can afford. Because if you live there, you, you can't afford to buy clothes in that area or buy food. That's also going to be a problem, you know, because you need those things. Like, mm, your children yeah. need clothes. You, yeah. you need to eat food. So if the food is still too expensive for you to buy those things that they actually get, get out the neighborhood to get those things. That's what I'm thinking. We need to try to build everything in that community to be help, able to help the family. And also if the people, they say kids are growing up need jobs, they can work, work, work at a local store or to work at a local or like retail store, because that's how it usually works in communities. Kids grow up there, they work in jobs there, you know? So I don't know. I don't know what the plan will be. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> so I hope it all works out. Um, yeah, well, I guess there's, there's a lot of different answers too. And I think that, you know, just building more affordable housing uh, this idea of, of converting uh, hotels and commercial spaces into permanent affordable housing could be huge. We'll see if that actually happens and or, you know I, I imagine it's, it'll happen to an extent, but see if that could, see if they could actually turn a lot of these types of buildings into permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness like the uh, state passed a bill called the Housing our neighborhood Neighbors with Dignity Act, Honda, where it's like gives some seed money to uh to start those types of building conversions and like turning them into affordable housing and it could be really good but see you know we need i think the will to actually do it and the will to say like people shouldn't be homeless and families and children in particular shouldn't be homeless and they shouldn't be homeless for as long as we are seeing people remain in shelter and so many people who are homeless who aren't in shelter or aren't in a shelter the entire time like people who are you know, spend some time in shelter. Maybe they spend some time with family or friends or a partner or rent a room and then they return to shelter. And so that's not necessarily calculated in, in uh, 
like when we think of how long someone is, is homeless for, but, you know, we're seeing that happen with tens of thousands of people and it's really not right. And I think we just need the will to create the housing and to say like, this is, this is housing for families. This is housing for families who are experiencing homelessness. I think what the city and state and especially the city have done a good job of is, is, is instituting protections like eviction protections for people and even before the eviction moratoriums that we've we've had in the state but just like the right to an attorney and housing court and and one-shot deals for people to make up their background like those are important for keeping people in their homes and now it's important to make sure people who are homeless can get homes that's definitely true it was so much things i feel like i forgot so much of what i was going to say but one thing I wanted to say is that um, the city need to work a little bit faster with certain things. Like, example, mm-hmm. one-shot deals. They tell you it's going to take about 30 days to 45. Sometimes it can take very, it takes much longer to get those things. So it's like, mm-hmm. people are, first of all, most times people don't even know about the one-shot deal. And when they find out about it, it takes forever to get it. And I know why the system kind of works that slow. They don't want to try to verify that everything is happening. But a landlord who has old, old money, they don't want to hear that, oh, HRA is taking forever. To give you the money they want the money right now and that can get you out of your apartment much yeah. faster yeah but i'm happy that new york does put a lot of things in place to kind of not have people be on the street but obviously it still was happening but i'm like with everything going on right now it's kind of slowed down compared to before and we're just trying to work on that also it was a hotel thing which i think is a good idea i had an idea too it was like they need to put more money into to building up the shelter not hotels Instead of bringing all these shelters, I don't know if you know, but you probably do, because this is what you do for a living. You find out information, you write about it. Um, hotel stays can be a lot of, not hotels, but the shelters can be a lot of money. To, for them to, oh, yeah, every month, yeah. the rent, expensive. Yeah. It's more expensive to house a person in a shelter than it is to, like, literally build a shelter, build a home for them, and put them into it. You will cut the cost of money so much. People say they probably won't stop because they said um, shelters is basically all about making money. But we shouldn't be thinking about it like that. If we have less people in shelters, we could do something with that space that actually could help people, like, other than just having them be shelters. Shelters might not ever go away, but we could have less shelters in New York if we just give people houses and um, apartment buildings to live in. Yeah, totally. It's, More it's ridiculous. Yeah. My rent for my room was $4,000 a month. Wow. For a bougie like room, in, uh, <laughs> apartment in uh, New yeah. York City, that's how much that costs. Yeah, no, that's no a way, great way to, no, to frame it. Yeah, exactly. It, like this one person talked to me and they said they had rats in their um in their shelter. When I moved in, people said in my shelter, particular people said they saw rats. I never saw it. Thank God. I don't know if I would have did. I would have just been going crazy. But I have seen roaches in the shelter. Um, they have things that don't work in the shelter, and it's like. You're paying all this money for horrible conditions, but people won't live in a horrible condition if that was in a $4,000 apartment in New York City. And if they do, probably get then the lease and they try to get out of it and won't stay there more than that year. If that happens, you know? People, like when you go to court and say, oh, my apartment is this, my apartment has more, my apartment has this. The, the, um, the, the judge would say, oh, that sounds like a bad condition. You can't stay there. But yet they make the shelters live and how because they feel like we're less than people and they don't fix it up, which I don't understand. If you have the money to get this from the city, build the place better so people can feel you know more at home at where they are in their life. So they have, like when they get on a different path, it'll be better for them. But they don't care. It's like we're not people. We're like I said, invisible people, and it's kind of sad. Yeah. No, there's no doubt about it. And yeah, I think you're totally right. And there's also like kind of an emphasis on on shelter when. Uh, they can shift some of that emphasis to, to housing and, and, and spending a lot of that money that they're spending on shelter to, to actually get people into permanent housing for just like a fraction of that cost. It's definitely true. It's, it's a waste, but I understand it's a business, but they have to do a little bit better for the people. If they want people to be successful, be kids' lives not to be in an uproar because it's affect the kids. At the end of the day, if families are in the shelter, kids are in the shelter. And if you care about kids so much that people always claim they do, you would want them to have a better life and a better living condition. And granted, it's not their fault while they're there, but you have to help their families get them out of there. That's how it, it kind of boils down to, if you think about it, if you, want, you don't want a kid in shelter, it means their family can't be in shelter. 
that's how it, how it kind of is. Also, we could talk about the youth population of shelter, of homelessness. Also, there's a people don't think about how big the youth, the young people are, especially if they leave like foster care if they ran away from their parents. You probably say, oh, why they run away? But some people run away for for valid reasons. You don't know what their parents are doing to them or how they're treating them, and they need to get a better life, so they do go in a shelter. So that demographic is also overlooked because it seems like you don't see them either. But you'd be very surprised when you go to a high school or junior high school, whatever, that these kids are homeless, not in a family shelter, just in a a, a youth shelter. And it's kind yeah. of, it's, it's very sad that these things are happening, but we don't talk about it enough that people know that this, these are happening. People say, oh, it's out of sight, out of mind. It's not happening. But no, it's here. It's affecting our children. If the ch children are our future, we have to make sure that the foundation that they have is like much better. Um, do you guys talk to a lot of young people who are in the shelter or just mostly families? I talk to a lot of young people too. And I've worked, I used to work in programs for, uh, for young people experiencing homelessness. So definitely, yeah, something I, uh, I'm always have my ears open to, to the experiences of, of young people. Uh, Cause I think, you know, you talk about people who are forgotten and they are often, often really left out of conversations around homelessness. So what, from that demographic in particular, what do you think their hardship is from your um, perspective? Is it the same like the family or is it a little bit different because they are single people technically, but they're under age. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think it's, it's hard because uh, a couple, I guess a couple things. Like, I think that there's a narrative around youth homelessness or like young adult homelessness that it's like, oh, well, you know, this, they can like couch surf. Like we were all young and we could kind of live that experience. And that's kind of coming from people who have not experienced homelessness and like right. <laughs> aren't seeing the need for like permanent affordable housing for, for young people who are homeless. Um, and they're kind of maybe dismissing it in that way. And then I think there's, you know, affordable housing, lack of affordable housing. And I think that's like definitely true for, for younger people who are probably just starting out in the workforce and like don't have a lot of money saved up. If, if they're homeless, likely don't have family who can su help support them. And so really on their own, like in entry level jobs, making like very limited amount of money. And so that makes it even harder mm -hmm. to, to get a place, even if, you know, maybe someone's on like a, a trajectory to earn a, a good salary or like, but still just starting out makes it really hard. And so I think that's another obstacle. And then there's just like very, I think not enough services for young people and young adults. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, in addition to just homelessness, like most young people and young adults in New York city who are experiencing homelessness are people of color who are facing like discrimination and racism uh like in every area of their life and then like a disproportionate amount of young people and young adults experiencing homelessness are lgbtq and that's like a whole nother uh set of obstacles and discrimination that they're facing and so they're yeah yeah it's it's i think it's a a, a population that people tend to forget about or, or dismiss and yet uh, uh people who, who need a lot more support from from the city, from the state, and yeah, from uh, yeah, more, I guess, just more support. Okay, do you have an idea of what they could put in place? Do you think it's probably the same thing they could put in place for families, or because these people are younger and with less money, so they put more things in place to kind of help them to kind of understand things much better? Uh, yeah, I get what you mean, like people kind of just starting out in life too and probably yeah. need kind of just like uh guidance in a way yeah guidance yeah exactly that's the way to say it and so i think there should be some more of that you know there's a lot of really great organizations that are providing that support and i think there just needs to be more of them and, and, and more funding for that um maybe more like specific housing for young people um and more opportunities to get the type of like housing assistance and housing vouchers that are available to uh, people in, in DHS shelters. 
Oh yeah. The guidance is a good point. Cause you know, people just starting out in their adulthood, like do need support and do have, are going to face obstacles. And so that kind of guidance would be pretty key. Yeah. I think, I know they was talking about how they just start giving parents or putting like in a fund for children. And when they get eight, I think it's 18, I believe I'm not even sure. Um, I guess amount of money. So when they get like a certain age, they would get it. Um, I think that'd be a good idea, but I'm like, what about the kids now who need those, those things now you're going to wait 18 years or we'll have whatever, how long they put the system in to me, I think they should have give money to a, like, but if you go to college or if you're working or whatever, I mean, give them a certain amount of money or do a class to show them how to do these life skills. Because honestly, high school in New York City, I don't know about anywhere else, I only grew up here. They don't teach you how to do these things. And some parents don't, even though they, they struggle as they, when they young, were younger, but yeah, they don't pass on the knowledge that they know. So it's like, they go out in the world just not knowing how to do things. And I can say that that was happening to me. My mother's from Jamaica. And a lot of skills in life, I just did not know. I made it, yeah. <laughs> but I just didn't know it, you know? And it's, it's better when you don't struggle. It's better if you don't have to struggle to get where you have to go. Some cultures and some people, from when their kids are young, they make sure their kids know certain things. So when they get to be an adult, they have all these things in their back pocket. Like my mom told me how to do this, how to balance a checkbook, how to, well, people don't write checks that much anymore, but write checks, um, know how to just do certain things, just how to take care of everyday life, how to cook, certain skills that you need just to be able to, how to re read a lease. I think certain things like that, reading the lease and know what you should or should not do that you can't bring a roommate out of nowhere. Like certain things people just need to know and they wouldn't get into so much trouble as like as a young adult that their parents are just leaving out. Probably the, they thought it was important to even tell them, but yet they needed it when they were younger. So why would you not just pass on the knowledge to your children? Um, I think guidance would definitely be be good for people, you know, to kind of help them out. And they won't be in the lurch for that, I think, that particular age group. I, I, to be honest, guys, I do not know that much about that age group because when I went home, I didn't, I wasn't put in that age group in particular. But I think that'd be like my two cents if I had to think of things to kind of help that age group to get a little bit better. Yeah, no, that's great. Those are great points. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any like lasting words that you want to give people to tell them about what they should think or what they should do or anything you want to give somebody who's listening right now? Um, yeah, I guess that, you know, we've had this crisis of homelessness in New York city for so long now that it seems like it's kind of like that it's not solvable or that it's kind of like a natural occurrence that we're just going to have to manage and deal with, but just kind of thinking of like, of homelessness as something that we really can solve and that being homeless doesn't mean that there's like anything wrong with people. It just means that they can't afford homes in our very expensive city. And so kind of framing it from that perspective as something that's fixable and that the solution to just have housing and to have supports that people need to remain in that housing and to stay healthy and to stay safe, you know, we can do that. It's just going to take will and it's going to take uh, not just people who are experiencing homelessness or their advocates to like stand up for that. It could take all of us to, to say that we want that and that we want to live in a city in an area where we don't have families and kids living in homeless shelters. Definitely. So David, where can the people find your writing? Do you want them to follow you on Twitter or Instagram? You can give out your information right now if you will. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. So you can follow me on Twitter at David F. Brand. That's at David F. Brand. You can read my uh, articles at citylimits.org. Uh, again, citylimits.org, nonprofit news organization. We've been around for 45 years. Uh, I cover a lot of issues related to family homelessness, uh, to homelessness, to affordable housing. So please check us out, check out the stories. And if there's anything that uh, you're encountering, if you're someone experiencing homelessness, if you're someone at risk of experiencing homelessness, you're an advocate, an attorney, social worker, you're in city government, uh, something needs exploration or something you think needs reporting, please reach out to me through city limits or uh, you can just send me a DM on Twitter. 
That is so good, guys. So we're about at the closing of Hear Our Voices. Guys, as you might know already, we have our new Twitter account. We have an IG account. So I'm not going to say it out because I honestly forgot them. <laughs> so everything will be in the description box below. And you can just click on the link. And his link will also be down below. So if you want to see anything about David, you can find out more information. Thank you for coming out. And don't forget also, guys, don't forget about the invisible people. That's kind of the theme for this message this week. Hmm. And I think it's a very good theme to have. They might be invisible to you, but they are real people. And just be better, do better, and help out when you can. Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks for, for having me on. <laughs> Thank you.